It always, it always goes you? back to that. Ladies <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and gentlemen, I am Dave Pat. I will be your host throughout this magical journey. We call it Bible study. Tonight's topic is the Ministry of Condemnation. I did not come up with the title. It's the title of the chapter. My subtitle is going to answer is this question. Why, why is it that when we don't take credit for God's work, why does it make you happier? Marissa, think about that. It's going to be that. <laughs> Why are you I don't know, you just looked at me. You just looked at me. Um, I, 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 want, I want to answer that question tonight, because I think when we talk about law and grace, the question, the question that we are answering is, why is it better for us when we don't take credit for God's work in our life? And ultimately, how does it make us happier? Because if you think, if you think about like human achievement and happiness, it's like the more credit we get, the happier we become. So if I, if I work hard at work and people are like, Dave has the greatest mobilizer ever, I'm like, yes. Times are good, right? And like, but, but somehow when we talk about our salvation, when we defer credit to God, somehow we are happy. All right, it's kind of crazy, but I'm gonna ask that question tonight. <clears throat> Let's go, Romans 4. <clears throat> Sorry, verse one. So what then shall we say? That Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter. If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Um, I, I, like, I like this verse a lot, because I like the Old Testament a lot. It's going to blow your mind if you've never heard this before. In the New Testament, we're saved by faith in Jesus. Okay, we all know that. How are you saved in the Old Testament? How are you saved when you don't know Jesus is coming yet? By being justified in the law. Think about that. If we say Jesus is the only way to heaven, can you be saved in the Old Testament if you do not if you do not yet know who Jesus is? That blow your mind. <laughs> think about that for a second, okay? Because I think I think this verse is gonna this verse is gonna answer it. If we as Christians say that Jesus is the only way to heaven, that therefore means that the people in the Old Testament too had to be saved by Jesus somehow. Which is a crazy thing, because he didn't actually come in the flesh yet. Okay? This, I think this verse is going to help us out. So what then shall we say? Because Paul is basically making this argument. Abraham, our forefather, all right, spiritual forefather, according to the flesh, what did he discover in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. So Paul's saying this argument. He's saying this argument. Think, Christians, think about this. Was Abraham really saved by works? even before the knowledge of Jesus came about. Because if he was saved by works, he would boast. <clears throat> but not before God. That's what Paul says. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. I think that's, that's the answer, and that's kind of the, the crazy verse that we're looking at. If you are Adam, okay? First man, <coughs> he just got banished from the garden. How do you get back into the garden? <laughs> How do you get back into the presence of God if you do not know who Jesus Christ is yet? And there's like pretty much no, you know, no evidence. <clears throat> what the Old Testament was doing, when you look at the laws, and you look at Leviticus, you look at Numbers, you look at a lot of Old Testament laws, the law never saved. What the law did was a point to a savior. What the law does is that it points to the fact that we are sinners, and it points to the fact that it is God alone who justifies. All right? And so this is how I answer that question. In the New Testament, we look back to Jesus to get saved. Right? We believe in what Jesus has already accomplished for us. We believe that and we get saved. In the Old Testament, you look forward to Jesus and what he will do on your behalf to get saved. In both instances, you are saved by faith, not by works. Right? And all the law does is show you your sin. Let me say that again. I'm going to my terrifying friends this. Okay. <clears throat> New Testament. We look back to Jesus. Right? Jesus is basically the salvation of all mankind. We look back to Jesus to get saved. Because we believe he's already accomplished for us salvation. Old Testament, you believe forward to Jesus. Because you believe he will accomplish your salvation. So in verse 4, Paul says, Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, 
That's an obligation. The argument here is, <clears throat> if, if, I'm, if I'm working for God, then, and if I, get, if I can earn salvation, wages are not credited, but as an Wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. So basically what he's saying is, if I work, there is no gift. God therefore owes me something. Right? So the Christian life, and that's, we, we act this way sometimes. The Christian life, therefore, is like, if I do good things, God owes me good things. I don't know if I ever shared with you guys this story. Some of you guys have heard it. <clears throat> One of the hardest times, I would say, in my, my missions life, at the time where I really learned theology, I remember, it was probably like the first or second year I came back from Shanghai. Um, it's when I still lived on Bonds, on Regents, near Bonds, La Regentia. Some of you guys know the area. So if you live in La Regentia, there's not enough parking spaces. So what a lot of people do is they park at the Bonds parking lot. Um, and you know they do, because you're like 1 a.m. in the morning, there's like 20 cars like just parked in the corner, the Bonds parking lot. And so I parked there for like, you know, I lived there like, for like three, four years in a row. So I, I just left my car there. I remember one year I came back from missions, and I you know, came back late one night and I just parked my car there. The next morning I came, woke up, went to the parking lot, and my car was gone. Right? I'm like, oh my gosh. And like, like there's, there wasn't a broken glass or anything like that, so I'm like, I'm guessing it's towed. So I called a tow company, and guess what? My car's been towed. I think at that time, I, th I think I was like 20 years old. And, you know, I got, I got the bill for my car towing. It's like 350 bucks, right? And being 20 years old, 350 bucks is always a lot of money, no matter how old you are. And I, I, I just really remember, like, being just really upset. I'm like, God, I just came back from missions. Like, I did so many good things. I'm like, the greatest 20 year old missionary ever? Like, how dare you tow my car? <laughs> but you see, you laugh at that because we think like that all the time. We think that if you, if you go to church, right, if you do, if you do holy things and do good things, that God somehow owes you something. You might not say that, but you feel, you feel that way sometimes. You know? Um, now, the one who works, which is not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, Okay, so if you don't think this way, but trust God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. I think something that we gotta move towards if we want to be mature Christians is why do we live holy lives? And why does it make us happy? Alright, my argument is that not because God will give us more stuff, or he'll give us all the desires of our heart. Because there's a lot of things that we desire that are good things. You know, health for your family, um, doing well at work, being nice to people, getting married, things like that, that are good things. But yet, if we're faithful as Christians for those things, they become idols. But if our faith, if the aim of our faith is to be righteous in the, in the sight of God, right? If our aim is to be in God's presence and for Him to see us as holy and as good, that's a good place to be. King David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, and blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. I want to ask that, I want to ask, ask that question. <clears throat> Why should it make us happy that we don't take credit for the good things we do? Right? Where when, the, when we face Old Testament law and like do not commit murder, do not steal, da 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 da. And we say, I am free of that because of Jesus, not because of what I do. Why does that make us happy? Because God wants to increase your faith. And because the most important thing I think in your life you can do as a Christian is to have faith in God. Right? <clears throat> I'm gonna I'm gonna show you that argument in a second. Because here's here's the dangers. Here's some things to look out for. Are you living by the law? <clears throat> Are you on the lookout for people to screw up? I, um, I've been going to ESPN a lot lately because of Tim Tebow and Jeremy Lin. It's been a very exciting year for me. <laughs> One of the stories on ESPN lately, like, apparently Tim Tebow signed with a, like a publicity agency you know, to handle his contracts. But like, there's like two big publicity agencies in Hollywood. He signed with like, both of them. And then he, was, he had his picture taken with like, Kate Upton, the Sports Illustrated model. And so people were like, oh my gosh, look at this guy, Tim Tebow. And then, so ESPN had like a 20-minute debate on whether Tim Tebow has like fallen or whatever. <laughs> it's funny because I feel like our culture is like on the lookout for that, right? Our culture is, just, is on the lookout for people like, you see that? You see that? I knew it was a screw-up, right? People are like, oh, this guy's a Christian? Oh, just 
give him like three months, and then we'll find some sin in his life. That's, that's on, the, on, the broad, on the broader scale. I think in our own personal lives we do that too. I, I, I'm, I guarantee you, if you look inside your heart, there are Christians in church who you've looked at and like, you know, I'm just waiting for that person to screw up. I know that person is not as holy as I think they are, right? That person's going to screw up. If you, okay, you guys are 20 something years old, right? You guys are honest with yourselves. You know that's happened in your life. <clears throat> I want to get down to the root of that. Why is that? I think, I think part of that is, is, a, is projecting our own insecurities. Right? Because if we feel that, you know, we look worse if people around us are more perfect. Right? We look, if everyone around us is perfect, we look worse. It's like, if you're, if you're, if you're like, all your friends are really good looking, and you guys like go out, and you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm not good looking. <laughs> right? Whereas if all your friends are like, just super like, ugly and like, disgusting, you're like, dude, I'm so good. <laughs> I'm like, the best looking person in this group. <laughs> Tina, you know what happens. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it happens, okay? Maybe there's a whole other people, but it happens. <laughs> what does that what does that say? What does that say about the Bible? Okay. The Bible tells us that the law is given to us to show us our sin to trust in Christ. The way we use the law is we use the law against others to show them how screwed up they are and how much better we are than them. A test for your own heart is if you're losing, using the law against others, is to test how do you look at others? And this question right here, are you looking, are you on the lookout for people to screw up? Right? Are you on the lookout for people to screw up? Or do you, second question, are you overly concerned about people seeing you mess up? Right? Both ways. One, one, one is a projection outward, one is a projection inward. <clears throat> but what both those questions ask is, Man, there's a, there's a standard I just live up to. And I look better if other people fall. So you're like looking for, looking for people to screw up. and like, okay, see, I'm, I'm better. Other way to look at that, there's a standard I have, to look, I have to live up to. I don't do it. Do people see that? Do people see right through me? Like, is my, is my Facebook and Twitter like, image like, being messed up? Do people see through to who I really am? Both those scenarios show that you're basically trying to live up to the law. Is there heavy dependence on faith in your life? Because <clears throat> the, the alternative is this. In your daily life and your spiritual walk, do you really, and this is the kind of question you get kind of pray to God, right? Do you say, God, I trust in you to grow me in holiness? Right? Because there's, there's different ways to look at sin. Okay? One way you look at sin, you're just like, man, I, I'm so messed up and like, People see right through me, uh, my reputation's ruined, or see how messed up people are, I knew they were so bad, see, I'm, I'm better. Both those scenarios you don't, doesn't require faith. I think the scenario God wants to move us towards is a place where, in our daily lives, we're saying, God, when I see sin in others, I believe that you will grow them in holiness. If you're a person that lives that way, right? If you're a person that lives kind of towards, towards the outside, you're saying, God, I believe that you will move them towards holiness by faith. For yourself, if you if you kind of the second person, you're concerned about people seeing you mess up. You're saying, God, I see sin in my life, right? And I know some people probably see it too. Would you grow me in holiness? There, there's something to be said about basing your your reputation on faith, right? I mean, you're hoping that the way people see you is the way that God is hoping, you know, is God is growing you, not who you are right now, but people kind of see you the way God is kind of shaping you towards. A better way to say that is basically this. <clears throat> One of the big things I'm really big on, right, especially because I think a lot of you are serving in, this, in CZ somehow, is transparency for leaders, right? Um, you guys think about, I might love Facebook to love Facebook, but there's a reason I love Facebook, right? When I, when I first started doing ministry, a lot of the people that I kind of looked up to in like leadership and like on the US national scene, Right? I'm like, man, these guys are freaking awesome. And I put them on pedestals. And then I would, you know, because people are a people, they would, they would mess up. Right? So you go through the last 10 years, you can, you can Google it. There's tons of Christian leaders who have messed up. Right? And I realized very, very long, early on why, why their, their mess ups was such a huge explosion. is because they weren't being transparent in their lives. It's because, like, people saw them as this, like, perfect person. And then they would mess up once. And it was, like, a huge explosion of like, all the stuff you didn't know about. Right? And then like, it just exploded like crazy. 
And so one of the things I realized in my ministry is that I wanted to be transparent. So if I was ever moving to that point, right, where this huge sin explosion would happen, my friends and community would keep me accountable. That's one of the things I, I hope for you guys too, right? When you guys, when you guys serve at this church, when you guys do the various things you do, I hope you guys are transparent. I hope you guys are honest with your sins, that you're not, you know, passive aggressive, and then when you see other people sin, you don't just like talk about them, and ne but never to them, all right? One of, one of the things about the law is that we have to be, we have to be open with when we screw up, we have to honestly confess that we screw up, right? And tell people our thinking process through that. And when we see others screw up, we have to be in a place where we're humble, right? So now I just like, see, I told you, you suck, right? But we're, we're confronting them, but we're loving them. <clears throat> Here's why. Ministry implications. I am scared when missionaries are overly slick. Um, this, last, this past week, I was, in, I was in Denver. It was, I don't know if you guys saw my YouTube video. It was pretty ridiculous. It was snowing like crazy. <laughs> One of the big blessings of being in Denver was I had I chance to meet two missionaries. Um, one was in Cambodia for about 20 years. He's a, he's a dentist. He works he works in the rural areas playing churches. Um, another guy he works with the Bui people in China, in the Guizhou province, like southern China. He's also in the rural villages. <clears throat> what I really appreciated about them is that they were so like, I guess not not impressive. <laughs> Right, like if I'm in the supermarket, I just be like, "Oh, this guy's kind of boring." <laughs> nothing about nothing about their speech was like, "This guy's a great preacher," or nothing about like their background or career experience. I'm like, "Wow, this guy's an amazing, impressive person." They're kind of very, very plain. I really like that about people who God uses, because then it depends on faith. I'm really, really concerned when people are like, "See, I'm super holy, and see, I'm super talented, and therefore God can use me." Right? That, again, is a dangerous place to be. We want to be able to see God work, not people work. Right? We get excited when God works. That's why I think the Jeremy Lin story is like so awesome, right? Because people are like, oh, this guy from Harvard, like, no one, no one drafted him, and then he like, exploded, and he got super good. And he says things like, you know, I don't know how I played so well. I think God was just controlling me. You know, and we get so excited when people say things like that. It's true. We want, we want to see God work. We're really not impressed if you're like, you work, 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 and you achieve something. Like, that's cool. We like that. But even if you're not a Christian, you love it when miracles happen. Right? There's something about our hearts where we long to see God work. Right? I guess my encouragement to you guys is to kind of see your life in that way. If there are things that you want to do for God, never, never doubt yourself because you're not super impressive in your resume or because of your skill set or whatever, or what people say about you. Right? It's the idea of living by faith, trusting that God will accomplish these things in you. I always talk about missionaries on the field, but I want to talk about supporters. Um, well, the, the house we stayed in at Denver last week, I was just super blessed. It was, it was me and another guy, that, uh, David, it was David Ho. He's, from, he's the guy who works with uh, the Bui in, in China. So on our itinerary, we, I just hear, or we're staying, we're staying at, a, at a mission home. All right, I'm like, okay, it's gonna be like this, like dinky little, like you know, two bedroom house. We we show up at our place. It wasn't one of the mission homes. It ended up, I guess, it was a guy who went to church with one of the OMF staff members in Denver, and his house is like, you know, a mile two from the office. And we get there, it's like super dark, so we just see a house. We can't really see what's inside it. <clears throat> and then we go in, and we're like, hello, anyone here? And then there's there's no one there. And we it's like this three page like letter right on the table. It's like, hey, sorry, I couldn't be there for you guys this week, but my house is yours, right? We walk in, this house has seven rooms. <laughs> All right. This house has seven rooms. It's like ridiculous. It's like MTV Cribs. All right. <laughs> and then his letter, he basically says, like, okay, as much, I put a bunch of food in the fridge for you guys, and uh, all the beds are already made up, so just make yourselves at home and just do whatever you want. That is that's a huge thing for me, right? Because I, I don't want really to trust people with, like, I don't know, my workout gloves. <laughs> right? This guy trusted us with this huge house. It was just us two living there the entire week. He, he wasn't even going to be there even when we were leaving. He basically just gave the keys to OMF and was like, hey, whoever you want to live in this house, just live in this house and eat my food. Right? I'm like, dude, that honestly so, so, so impressed me. Um, and then, and then as, as we were leaving, I saw on the counter, he, and then he wrote a note to, like, to, like, to Peggy or something. I'm like, well, who, who's this to? And then it's like, hey, I have you guys stay in my place. After they leave, can you please do a new load of laundry and clean all the sheets? Because I guess he hired a maid, right? 
so that even after we left, he would basically just pay for all the cleaning of the house. I mean, it's, it's things like that. I'm just like, and I, and I, and I, saw, I saw the guy's picture. He's not a very impressive guy. He's not like super buff or like, you know, stud guy. Like, I'm super rich. He's like just kind of this normal, plain looking guy, you know. But I, I thought about what he did and how he supported us and how he blessed us. Man, it was just, it was just an amazing thing. Um, I guess I'm from San Diego, so I've seen nice houses. But David, he, uh, he, he's been working in the boonies, right? So he went to his house, he's like, oh my gosh, this place is so nice. <laughs> right? And then like, which room do you want? He's like, I want the smallest room. I'm like, why? He's like, if I sleep in a nice bed, I can never sleep in the good villages again. <laughs> It'll never be good enough. <laughs> but I'll tell you this, for, I think for David, he was super blessed. He was super blessed by this OMEX supporter and just his, his generosity and openings that passed to us. And it was just an awesome blessing for us. That's not a super slick story. You know, this guy wasn't just wasn't super awesome in any impressive way. He was just generous with what he had, and I, th- and I think that's what God wants us to be. Just to use what we have, to use by faith. <clears throat> I want to tell you about Chio. Point out who's, who's in this picture, so you guys should know this person. This is Chio. This is, I think, apple or pear. I don't know. The only Chinese name is fruits. I think it's I think it's apple. Um, but but ap- apple's one I can tell you guys about. She came to college ministry. Um, and then she actually got baptized like, not too long, like three weeks ago or something like that. So from the summer when we went there to now, she's, she's heard about the gospel, accepted the gospel, been baptized. Um, and what they're actually doing on this trip is that Chio, and this is the, the, cafe, she, the cafe she goes to, is owned by, the, by this girl. She either owns it or she was working there. Um, but she invited her to go to Apple's hometown in like Yunnan province, right? Because Apple wanted Chio to preach the gospel to her parents. All right, so Chio, if you read her blog, she has a whole story about, about doing that. <clears throat> that. I mean, we want people to see faith in our lives as well as holiness. All right? I think, I think for Chio, you can definitely see holiness in her life. But I hope what you guys see also a lot of is faith. All right? I'm glad that Chio is in the super slick. All right? You guys, if you've met, met her, like, by talking to her, you would not think she's an evangelist. Okay, I'm just, I'm just being honest with you, okay? I don't feel like Bethel reference for her. By talking to her, she is not impressive. All right, on paper, nothing she does is impressive. That story of going to Yunnan province, right? This is the first time she's been in China, like mainland China, right? She traveled two days with strangers that she just met, with a girl she just led to Christ and baptized to preach to her parents. That's like out of a missionary biography, right? That's some crazy stuff. She's like, what, 21, 22 years old. Um, so if a missionary is, is too unctuous, that's bad? What does that word mean? Unctuous, like a greasy personality. Here, here, here's, here's what I'm saying. <clears throat> if you're super talented, which I think every, a lot of people in this room are, all right, God's still going to use you. But what I'm saying is this. If you have insecurity in your life, let people see faith in your life. That's my challenge to you guys. Let people see faith in your life. It's important for us when we interact with non-Christians and with Christians that they see our holiness. Right? They see that we don't do drugs, we don't have sex, we don't drink and do that bad stuff. Okay? It's just as important for people to see faith in our lives. It's just as important that when we screw up, we don't say, oh man, I gotta work harder. Okay, because we do that a lot as Christians. Right? When we we mess up, we fall short, we're like, man, I gotta work harder. And like God, you know, God helps those who help themselves. The Bible doesn't say that though. It doesn't say that. It's just as important for you to show the world that when there's something that you want to do for God, something you want to do for God, it's just as important for them to see that you're not able to do it and you're asking God to do it. All right? That's the key to, to living by grace and not by the law. Because if you try to live by the law, you're basically saying, like, okay, this is why I need to jump, I need to jump this high to get above this bar. If you live by grace, you're basically like, God, can you just throw me over the bar? <laughs> and it sounds really stupid, okay? It sounds really stupid. But that's, that's one of the things you got to believe. <clears throat> I think this, I can't, I left it vague and open for a lot of you guys. I hope you guys, when you guys bring the smoke up right now, you guys talk about where you are in your life, um, personal journey with God, what it, what it means to have faith in your life, and what that looks like. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, I thank you um, that you have came to save us and that you credit us as righteous. And Lord, I pray that you will guide us this night to be open um, 
that you would bring to mind all the things that you've already been leading in our lives. But Lord, use this as a time of holiness. Use this as a time where you are setting us apart, growing our faith, and deepening our walk with you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we also have the next chapter right there. So you best try yeah.